case was beginning to drag. My client was complaining about my lack of progress in finding evidence of his wife's suspected infidelity. The one lead I had, the name Bob Martin, was beginning to look like a dead end street. I typed Bob Martin into Google and although there are plenty of men by that name, it strongly suggested a connection to some kind of vitamin pill for dogs. Why would she be giving a pick-me-up to dogs? I rejected that possibility and instead decided to track down, using the phone book, the Bob Martin who lived nearest to her. It turned out the nearest was in King's Cross and I headed straight there in my newly acquired second-hand jag. The rain had stopped and the night hung heavy in a shroud of fog that camouflaged London's seedy corrupt and wanton features. It also made it hard to see the numbers on the doors along the King's Cross Street. I was slowly driving down looking for number two, the home of the mysterious Bob Martin. I figured if I parked somewhere near his place and just sat in my car with the camcorder at the ready, then if my client's wife was to pay a visit, I could capture the incriminating evidence that I was after. I continued to slowly drive down the street, but I couldn't find the number two. After quite a bit of driving up and down, I decided to ask a lady who I spotted leaning on a letterbox if she might be able to give me directions. I pulled over beside her and wound down my window. I beckoned her over. She seemed friendly, and she asked me what I was looking for. I said I was looking for number two. She replied that she may be able to help, and without invitation, opened the passenger door and slipped into the seat beside me. I was taken aback by her boldness as she muttered something about it costing me 50 quid. I would never usually pay someone just for directions, but I was desperate, so I handed her five crispy ten pound notes. It was then that she suddenly said, So, you want some perverted shit sex, do you? Well, you're under arrest for curb crawling, and she showed me her badge. Well, my first instinct was that she was some sort of con lady carrying out a scam on me. So I immediately tried to push her out of the car. But as I did, she reached down and produced some sort of weapon. At that point, I used my private dick training that I'd read from a leaflet, and I made a run for it. But as soon as I got out of the car, she tasered me. I fell to the ground, having convulsions as thousands of volts surged through my body. After a few minutes of laying there on the rain-soaked London street, I was dragged to my feet by several policemen and taken down to the nearby police station. I won't bore you with the details of all that occurred in the police station, but after several hours of me repeatedly telling them that my only crime was naivety, I was finally released after being charged with soliciting, assaulting a police officer and resisting arrest. It was turning out to be not a very good day. My car was parked about a mile from the police station, so I decided to walk back to it to try to carry on with my case. After walking for quite some time, I suddenly made a discovery. I discovered I was lost. It was now late. The streets were quiet, and most of the shops were closed, except for a sex shop. So I went in, hoping that I could get some directions back to my car. Not being the kind of man who frequents sex shops, I was amazed at the array of goods available. There were magazines that catered for all kinds of bizarre tastes. I spotted one called Monks Are Hunks, a cover called It's Runny, I won't tell you what was on the cover, and there was even one called Pedos in Speedos. I walked up to the counter and asked the man if he would give me directions to where I'd left my car. He said he didn't even know that I had a car. I could tell it was going to be of no use and that my visit was a complete waste of time. So I just bought a copy of Bob's Your Uncle, So Is Fanny, a tube of slide and ride, some love eggs, a butt plug, a vibrating cock ring, a hundred rib condoms and an inflatable doll called Brenda. And I left. As I once again walked the cold foggy London streets, I noticed on the box that Brenda was in it stated puncher resistant. Just like a real woman, it's most unlikely to go down. 
I continued my way through the cold, damp, foggy night, and I noticed a tramp with a bottle of cider in one hand, and he was prodding a stick into some dog shit with the other. Feeling sorry for his plight, I said to him, Are you okay? Is there anything I can do to help? He looked up at me with a sad, world-weary expression and a tear in his eye, and he said, Fuck off, and he flicked the dog shit right in my face. When I got to the end of the street and turned the corner, I at last recognised where I was and headed back to my car. I remembered that when I was arrested, my car was parked outside a shop called Jose's 24-hour emergency paella. When I arrived at the spot, my car was gone. The day was going from bad to worse. All I could do then was to catch a night bus home and hope that the next day would, would bring better fortune. As I stood there waiting for a bus, a man approached, pulled out a knife, and robbed me of my money, my porn DVD, the lube, the love eggs, the cock ring, the condoms, and he even took Brenda, the inflatable doll, who won't go down. He took all of that and fled, leaving me standing there at four in the morning with nothing except for the butt plug that for some reason he didn't seem to want. Rain began to fall again and I took shelter in a doorway. I was feeling so low, so alone and vulnerable, that as I sat there in that shop doorway, I unwrapped the butt plug and sucked on it like a dummy. And right then, at that very moment, I thought to myself, I want my mummy.